I'd like to welcome all of you. We have a, a very interesting topic today. My name is Ruth Bridger. I'm the VP of Marketing at SORCOM and have chosen today to talk with you about getting the best possible performance out of your Astrospace IP PBX. Let's see what's on the agenda. First of all, I'd like to tell you the goal of the webinar give you a few of our credentials so that you'll understand where we're coming from when we deliver this information. We'll go into a bit of detail on what we term to be the five culprits or uh, those criteria that are responsible for degradation of performance. We'll share with you the results of load tests that we have recently completed for our high-end IP PBX model. We'll also provide some guidelines for achieving the best performance from your IP PBX. And we'll leave time at the end for questions and answers. The first thing that uh, I'd like to present here is a common misconception. The idea is that the more money you pay for the server, the better the performance you will get from your asterisk system. Unfortunately, you will end up paying too much for an unsuitable solution. And this is basically the crux of this presentation, that what we're trying to do is to use components that could be applicable for many different kinds of applications and adapt them for a very specific purpose, which is running our telephony systems. Another clarification that I'd like to make is that the details that uh, we'll discuss here relate to what I call a workhorse PBX, meaning not something for residential use or a demo system, but rather a PBX that's needed for a very challenging environment where you have a, a high number of simultaneous calls required. So keep this in mind. We're going to review the parameters that affect performance and we're going to provide some criteria for choosing the correct hardware and we'll also give some tips on how to optimize the software so that you will get the best performance. Last but not least, we'd like to pass along some of the lessons that we've learned along the way by building our own uh, standalone IP PBX appliances. Uh, we decided to pass along these experiences because we found that time and again, we and our partners have been running into these challenges, you know, when trying to estimate the hardware requirements for large implementations. Our customers simply want to be sure that they can perform a certain amount of concurrent calls. And our implementers want to be able to meet those requirements without going overboard. So how do you, you know, kind of stay on that fine line? Not spending too much, not going overboard on the requirements, but still managing to beat the expectations of the customer. A few words about SORCOM. Uh, the company was established in 2004, and all of our products are based on asterisk. Our engineers are very active in the asterisk community. And as a matter of fact, our drivers have been a standard component in asterisk uh, for over four years now, since version 1.2.4. We have award-winning, flexible, and modular telephony interface solutions, which are based on what we call XPP technology. This technology uses a USB 2 connection in order to communicate with the Asterisk server. Now, because our drivers are standard in Asterisk, we do have kind of that native attachment to Asterisk, and that is what provides us with great flexibility and ease of implementation when connecting additional telephony modules. You can see here at the bottom of the screen, this is a photo of the Astrobank, which is our telephony interface solution. Each one of these is a telephony board 
which can carry analog or digital ports and they can be mixed and matched and as you can see they're all external to whatever asterisk server you're using and this provides a lot of benefits as we'll see in future slides. Now we are dedicated to providing built-in reliability in our systems and this is another reason why we are so concerned with building a top-notch architecture using the correct hardware needs to be reliable and deliver the high performance. I wanted to say something about IP gateways. I guess although it should be clear from the previous slide that our external USB 2 based connectivity has obvious advantage over PCI cards which you know you need to be opening up the server and having the system down while you you make any kinds of adjustments you may be asking yourself you know why should I go through all this trouble to try and understand what kind of server can carry all of those Astrobank units when I can just use an IP gateway and then it's all SIP and therefore no headache. I don't know how many of you think that way, but uh, we have had a lot of questions from the field asking, you know, how, how can we compete against IP gateways? They're, they're so low cost and everybody, you know, knows about them. They're very prevalent in the market. Well, the truth is it's a false assumption that they carry less headache especially when you're talking about large systems. In these kind of cases, integrators face much more complexity, not less, from IP gateways. You can see that by just taking a look at this comparison chart. You can sum up the advantages of the Astrobank approach to that of the IP gateways basically in three words. Easy, simple, and reliable easy because installing Astrobank is as close to plug and play as telephony can get. Astrobank, like I mentioned before, because of the native drivers, is automatically detected and configured by the asterisk IP PBX. So there are no interoperability issues or complex configuration requirements. Simple because it's centrally managed, so it's easy uh, to maintain remotely and all of the activities are performed interfacing to this single device, the asterisk IP PBX. And last but not least, it's reliable because the Astrobank is LAN independent. Remember, I said it connects to the server via USB 2 cable. Using that dedicated 480 megabit USB 2.0 for all of the communication guarantees that it will be flawless and independent of other devices on the LAN and therefore unaffected by LAN performance, for example. So those are very important things to keep in mind and I think then you'll understand why we're not even going to go any further into the IP gateway option. So what exactly are these five culprits that are out to kill our performance? I've divided them into five categories. CPU, firmware motherboard design, chipset, peripherals, and application. Let's look at the first one, which is the CPU. Speed is very important, okay? And a way that you can increase this is by disabling the CPU hyperthreading when you have many Astrobanks connected. It turns out that the hyperthreading halves each CPU core. And as a result of that, each interrupt will be performed up to two times slower than a virtual CPU core. So keep that in mind. The number of cores is also a factor. Even though increasing the number of cores doesn't necessarily improve the performance, in some cases it even degrades the performance. And we'll show this to you when we discuss the results of the load test that we have performed. However, uh, we have noticed that the additional cores are beneficial, especially when additional applications, such as call centers, are run on top of the asterisk. The last um, statement in this category has to do with MMU, that's Memory Management Unit. Some processors under test have demonstrated very bad MMU performance. So this is something else to watch out for uh, when you're putting together your hardware. 
For culprit number two, the firmware motherboard design, as for the core workload, there are some things that you can do to optimize uh, them for asterisk. We've seen on different platforms, we tested IBM servers as uh, an example. The way that they split the mission among the available core is different than the way that we do it on our server. Okay, We note that the IBM performance is less than that of the Torcom dual core XR3000. And this optimization, turns out, is a function of the BIOS architecture. But of course, you must be aware that sometimes the motherboards with multiple cores are not optimized for operation with asterisk. And this is something that I'll keep repeating because, you know, it may be a computer, but a computer that was destined for various kinds of applications and not necessarily specifically for asterisk. As a matter of fact, you can probably count on the fact that it was not. SORCOM architecture, on the other hand, is based on chipsets with cores that are optimized for use with asterisk. Another component of the firmware motherboard design uh, criteria is the efficiency of the interrupts. Okay? It's possible to get much better performance results when the Astrobank driver is configured to perform the heaviest tasks on software interrupts instead of on the hardware interrupts. Okay? However, this may not be correct for some other motherboards and processors. In some cases, sticking with hardware interrupts gives better results. For example, our recommendation is relevant to our XR3000 servers, but not for the IBM server that we tested. So basically what I'm saying is that this is just an option that's worth testing on other platforms. As a bottom line, I would say that it's best to go with a platform that has been tested for use with asterisk so that there will be no tuning surprises. Just as an example, I'm uh, showing you some examples here. You'll note that we have the quad core listing here. And what do we have? A very unbalanced load on these CPU cores. The first two CPUs have split traffic between them, and the last two are completely inactive. So this is a, an example of unbalanced load. Sometimes it's possible to distribute the load more equitably, and sometimes it's fixed code in the bias, and there's nothing that can be done. So this is something else that you really need to look out for. On the side of the chipset, you have to look at the Ethernet chipset, the USB chipset, and for large installations that contain hundreds of analog ports, such as you would find perhaps in hospitality, uh, we recommend using an, an additional PCI-based USB controller because that will help ease the load on the motherboard's USB. Now we get into uh, the criteria known as peripherals. A factor here is memory speed, that's RAM. And in addition, hard disks, memory size, and RAM disk. We've noticed that insufficient RAM adversely affects the operating system by accessing the hard disk instead, okay, and that greatly reduces processing performance. For standard Elastix installations that don't use the recording, the call recording uh, facility, one gigabyte of RAM is typically sufficient. Last but not least is the application. We've noticed that the larger stack size is more stable for high loads, okay? And we're presenting here the command that removes the stack size limitation, so you might want to use this. We've observed that, really, asterisk is much more stable under a high load when the process stack size is large. Another thing that you can do to optimize asterisk is to turn off the flash operator panel if you're not using that. And there are ways to optimize the OSLEC, which is the open source um, echo cancellation software that is part and parcel of asterisk. For example, we've added an option to work with MMX, which is multimedia extensions, and this improves the OSLEC performance. 
uh, we supply Daddy with OSLIC optimized for MMX. And optimization of echo cancellation tail is possible by setting it to different sizes for different ports. So bear that in mind. One last tip. In default mode, Daddy relates to all inactive channels just as if they were active. So it is possible, however, to compile the Daddy with the optimized channel parameter enabled. And as a result, the Daddy will not waste time with the voice packets that are received from inactive FXS or FXO channels. Okay, let's take a look at the load tests. We performed um, three different load tests. The first one, we used an XR3000, that's the unit here at the top, and we attached it to 20 XR0008 Astrobanks. Okay, so 20 of these units here. Each one supports 32 FXS ports. That was in test number one. Test number two, we used, again, the XR3000, and this time we attached it to four digital devices. Each one of these Astrobanks supports four E1 or T1 ports, and we used the G729 open source codec to uh, get SIP calls. In the third test, we used this same configuration, except that instead of the G729 codec, we used a G711A codec. The results of these uh, tests, by the way, are published now on our website. If you go to uh, the white paper section, Load Tests, you'll see now that there's a, um, a section devoted to the XR3000. We have done tests in the past for the XR1000 and XR2000 as well, but if you just uh, come here, you'll be able to see the results online and um, download the PDF file that contains all of the uh, details. Uh, just a few photos of uh, the work in process. Uh, here you see uh, the Astrobanks, um, the servers connected. We use USB hubs uh, to connect the servers to the Astrobanks. Regarding the test conditions, we used version 1.6-12 of Elastix, Daddy 2.2.1, Asterisk 1.4.29, for the test with the G729 codec, we use the open source version. And most important to note, we did use all of the improvement tips that uh, we have covered thus far in this webinar. Okay, so let's take a look at the results. Uh, if you'll remember, the first test was with the analog devices. We had 20 Astrobanks with 32 FXS ports each for a total of 640 extensions supporting 160 I.O. ports, a total of 800 Daddy channels. This first column here is when we tested with a dual core processor. And the second column here is for the quad core. And you'll see how the size of the echo tail does uh, affect the performance, the number of simultaneous calls that you can get. But you'll notice that in uh, every case except for the first one, actually the dual core is the best option for this configuration. A bit surprising, I would say. In the second test, where we connected four digital Astrobanks to the XR3000. We have a total of 16 T1 or E1 ports, a total of 480 Daddy channels. Again, we'll take a look. We'll see that for the dual core processor, um, the number of simultaneous calls is uh, quite a bit lower than what can be achieved with the quad core. The last test with the G711A codec, again, we have 
four Astra banks with four ports apiece for a total of 16 E1 ports, same number of daddy channels as the previous uh, slide. But in this instance, we've added um, the PCI Ethernet board uh, to relieve some of the load uh, for the USB processor. And here are the results. Again, very interesting. The dual core seems to give the best performance in this case when we're talking about the G711A SIP calls. Okay, let's try to summarize uh, the conclusions here. If you're running a G729 codec for an E1 or T1 connection, your best bet is to go with a quad-core processor. It turns out that it provides practically 50% better results than the dual core. However, if you're using the G711A codec, on an E1 or T1, the dual core processor provides 24% better results than the quad core. So that's a little reversal. And for systems with a large number of FXS, again, the dual core provided the best performance statistics. So what are our guidelines for you? A higher CPU Core speed provides the best performance. Faster RAM provides best performance. Hardware interrupts handling must be evenly distributed between the cores. However, take note, some high-end servers don't support, you know, this manual kind of balancing of the load. Hyperthreading should be disabled because the virtual cores will work in half of the physical core speed and it slows down the interrupt handling. In many cases, delegation of most work on the hardware interrupts to these so-called tasklets allows better performance. However, it is possible to get the opposite results some of the motherboards and CPUs that we've tested. Okay, like I mentioned before, while the recommendation is relevant to our XR3000 servers, it does not apply to the IBM server that we tested. So we recommend that this is something worth testing on platforms other than the XR3000 if you're, if you're um, trying to put together your own server. The bottom line, Unfortunately, it is impossible to get clear guidelines from the hardware manufacturers, so it's up to you to test, test, and then test some more. I'll thank you all for uh, joining us today, and of course you're invited to submit topics uh, if you'd like us to cover uh, anything in particular in future webinars. Again, thank you all very much for your time, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.